two verses, but they're important verses that shape the life of our faith together. It's found in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, it's verses 1, verse 14. In the beginning was the Word of God, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we have listened to your word read, and in this reading may we hear. In our hearing, may we understand. In our understanding, may we believe. And in our believing, may we serve you. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. These days, 45% of young adults do this every day. That's up 4% when compared to the 1980s. So that means young adults are doing it more and more and doing it every day. Can you guess what these young adults are up to on a daily basis? Taking naps. What was that, Carl? Taking naps. Taking naps. It's a good guess. Do you have guesses? Texting. Pray. Very good. Pray. They're up to prayer. As of September of last year, a Fox News poll found that 77% of Americans believe prayer heals. The Pew uh, Research Center's on Forum on Religion and Public Life polled Americans in 2007. It was a while ago, but I think it still holds true. And they found that nearly 60% of our nation prays. Well over half of our nation prays. What about our prayer life here at the United Methodist Church? Nearly four months ago, a group of individuals from our congregation attended a lay speaking class on prayer. And as they returned, I heard about all the wonderful news that they had, and all the fun that they had, and how they were so fired up about the importance of prayer, and yet how seldom the church had taught them during that same period of time, I took mental note on how often someone mentioned prayer. Someone in the church commented about the importance of prayer. And then I began to think deeply about the concept of prayer. I began to pay attention to how frequently I was asked in church to pray before meals and before meetings. And then I decided to try a little experiment. Maybe you were one of those who were part of it unknowingly so. Whenever I was asked to pray for a meeting or a meal, I asked someone else to do it instead. Of course, I got the responses that I imagined I would get. I got responses such as, oh, gee, me? I can't pray. Or I get, but, but you're the pastor. And there was even thrown in there with a wry smile the comment, that's what we pay you for. <laughs> Of course, I chuckled along as you just did, and like a good pastor, did my job and prayed. But inwardly, I, I wondered, what's the issue? Do they pray at home? Surely they do, but, but what makes praying such a difficulty for my parishioners at church? Have they never been taught to pray? If well over half of our nation prays, and as Christians, we're anxious or find it difficult to pray at our church. I think that's something we need to be talking about. And so indeed, for the next six weeks, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be talking about prayer. We'll be asking ourselves questions like, what is prayer? How should we pray? Who do we pray to? What do we do with unanswered prayers? And does prayer change anything? My prayer for this six-week sermon series is that we would grow in our practice of our prayer lives together, such that you would not only be willing, but anxiously awake being called upon by the pastor to pray before meetings or meals or other occasions in our church life together. So let's get on with it. 
As we consider prayer, it won't be too long until we ask ourselves the simple but obvious question. What is prayer? What is prayer? Of course, we aren't the first to ask and wonder about this question. Henry Nouwen, the 20th century's foremost writer on spiritual practice, says, Prayer is the only and necessary thing. And he continues to say, Prayer is living with God here and now. George Appleton once wrote, Prayer is essentially man standing before God in wonder, awe, and humility. Does that describe your prayer life? No oh, wonder. The existentialist philosopher Sjorn Kierkegaard defined prayer allegorically. He said, a man prayed. And at first he thought that prayer was talking. But then he became more and more quiet. Until in the end he realized prayer was listening. Finally, I'd like to lift up the words of the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley. As he lifts prayer to its highest. As he once wrote, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. God does nothing but an answer to prayer. That sure lifts up the importance of our prayer lives, doesn't it? Perhaps a, another way to answer the question, what is prayer, is to look in Scripture. Perhaps the first prayer that's offered in Scripture by a human being is Cain, as he prays for God's mercy. Father the murdering of his brother. The Israelite people together pray for deliverance from Egyptian slavery. Anna prays for a child. Elijah prays for rain. Many together join their hearts in prayer as they pray for St. Paul's health to be restored. Who can't relate to prayers like that? Prays for God's mercy and deliverance, prays for, for rain. Prayers for your children, for God's blessing, for health. Yet as much as we can relate to prayers like that, I wonder, is this what prayer is? Jesus himself, of course, prays too. We have recorded his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest. We also have recorded his prayer and farewell to his disciples as he prays for Christian unity in John's Gospel. Jesus prays at least 25 separate occasions as recorded in the Gospels. Most of which merely mention the occasion of his prayer rather than the words that he used. Okay, so some great thinkers had some thoughts on prayer. Sure, Scripture shows us that lots of people prayed, especially Jesus, but that only tells us that they prayed. So I think that's an important point that Jesus and others did pray. It still leaves that question kind of out there, doesn't it? What is prayer? I kind of agreed with the kids this morning. Whenever someone had asked me what prayer was, I would have said, talking to God. Communicating with God. Now that I thought more deeply about that, I realized prayer has to be something deeper than simply communicating with God, isn't it? I must confess that so often in my prayer life, my prayers are often filled with, God, do this. God, do that. God, don't let this happen. My prayers are usually more polite than that, but that usually summarizes the bulk of my prayer life. Yet deep down, as an ordained minister, if you'll permit me in public to admit it, I yearn for more in my prayer life. I yearn for more. Deep down, I want more for my prayer life than mostly asking God to do stuff for me and for others. But granted, I often ask for important stuff in my prayer life. Prayers such as your healing or someone else's needing to be fed or someone else knowing God's comforting grace in time of grief and loss. That's important stuff, right? Yet deep down, I hear from more. I wonder. Do you ever feel like that in your prayer life? Come on. If you do, perhaps you feel like me and a need to have a new way to think about prayer. A bigger definition, a broader imagination for prayer. Well, the best response that, that I've come across to date comes from a man named Philip Yancey. As he 
offers it in his book, Prayer, doesn't make a difference. And that's what I'll be using throughout this sermon series. Yancey simply suggests that prayer is keeping company with God. Prayer is keeping company with God. To put that a different way, prayer is the means by which we befriend God. I like this understanding. I like it because it makes prayer bigger than a tool to ask God and to get God to do what I want. To give me the things that I ask for. In our hearts, we know that prayer is bigger than that. Prayer is bigger than simply asking God for stuff. I like Nancy's definition because it also focuses on relationship. It helps us remember there are two sides to any relationship, even the ones with God. I like this definition because it lifts up prayer as an ongoing thing. Keeping company with God. When it's put that way, it suggests that it's something that doesn't, doesn't happen, but it requires ongoing work and effort. And that's true of how we relate to many things and many people in our lives. And I think that's true of our relationship with God, too. Prayer is the tool that we use to relate to God. It's the way we keep company with God. Of course, we'd be foolish to think that this whole keeping company with God thing starts with us. After all, this thing that we call life didn't begin with us. It began with God. To be sure, God was the one who started this whole thing we call life. And so if, if prayer is, is our tool to keep coming with God, what does God use to relate to us? What does God use to keep company with us? Does God pray to us? That seems like a strange way to look at it. At the beginning of John's Gospel, it tells us exactly how God chooses to keep company with us. John tells us that God was born in human form, taking on upon himself all of humanity, the child born of a woman named Mary. God describes God's efforts to keep company with us through the birth of the Son using a particular Greek word. The Greek word is skenoo. I checked out Jeffrey, let me answer that question. <laughs> skenoo is, is a word that has a specific meaning. It's translated all sorts of different ways in our bodies. Sometimes the word appears as lived, or dwelt, or tabernacled. And the word became flesh and lived, dwelt, tabernacled. I'm particularly fond of the paraphrase that Eugene Peterson does with this verse of Scripture. He says that the Word was made flesh and moved into our neighborhood. God moved into our neighborhood with the person of Jesus Christ. After all, how can someone hope to keep company with someone else unless that person moves into the same neighborhood? John helps us to see through this verse of Scripture that God has chosen to keep company with us through the birth of God's Son. God moved into our neighborhood and sought out our company. Jesus kept company with humanity by dwelling among us in our flesh. This is how God keeps company with us. This is how God chooses to pray to us. If we define prayer as keeping company with God, in some sense, then, Jesus' life is a prayer itself. <clears throat> Jesus' life is the manner through which God chooses to keep company with us. What if we conceived that prayer wasn't just about our fragile waiting upon God's response to our requests, but that prayer was also God's waiting for our response to His request in Jesus? If we can imagine prayer like that, wouldn't it mean that Jesus is God's invitation for our company? Wouldn't it mean that Jesus is God's prayer request to us, to humanity? After all, this is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of the gospel where we are told that Jesus, <coughs> in Jesus, God has made the ultimate and divine invitation, prayer request, you might say. For our company. This is how God chooses.
chooses to invite us into the life of God, and this, this invitation, this prayer request, isn't, isn't made via Hallmark and the United States Postal Service. God's invitation, the opening up of God's very life, is made to us through Jesus Christ. God's invitation is made to us as Jesus weeps his own tears, as he weeps with us over our dead. God's life is open to us as God shows us through Jesus and reveals God's kingdom through healing sinners and tax collectors and lepers. God's invitation is made as Jesus offers his life as a ransom for many. God's invitation to keep company with God is offered as Jesus' body is offered for us upon the tree. This invitation, this prayer request to join in God's life and enter God's very heart is made from the heart of Jesus. The same heart that lovingly and willingly gave it all for all of us. And this invitation, this prayer request doesn't stop there either. As God waits for our response, God shows us the results of saying yes. God reveals the power of God's glorious grace as God raised Jesus from death to glory. As God waits for our yes, God shows us what saying yes to that invitation truly means. And all that Jesus went through, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, all that is how God has chosen to keep our company. This is God's prayer for a life with us. And God waits for us to respond. What if prayer was about responding to God's request, God's prayer, that we would choose to keep company with God? The same one who sought our company so much that he willingly gave up God's Son, so that we might have a way to the Father. What if our prayer was about our choice to respond to God's desire for our company, our friendship? How would our prayer life change? If we imagined the goal of prayer was simply to befriend God? How would our prayer language change? The words that we use. Would we even need to use words? How might imagine prayer this way change how we imagine God? What if we imagined that prayer was simply keeping company with God? If we did, perhaps our whole relationship with God might change too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>